Okay, everybody. So we're back. And uh, this is the whole reason I wanted to bring Pete Charette back to Game of Crimes for a second interview. As you heard in the first episode, he was originally interviewed back in April of 2023 on episode 92. If you've ever heard about the French Connection, if you've seen the movie about the French Connection, if you've read a book about the French Connection, but now you want to know the truth, go listen to episode 92 because the man with me today is the man that did the undercover for how many years was it, Pete? Like three years, I think you just uh, said? Uh, six years. Six years. Holy cow. So if you want to know the truth, this is the place to come for the truth, all right? But uh, the reason I want to bring Pete back is because he was involved in one of the largest cocaine conspiracy cases, probably the largest, I believe you said, in the in the history of the United States. It's an operation that was called Operation Southern Comfort, just like the, the liquor bottle. It's a it's a case that I heard about and an operation that I heard about over the years. I never was involved with it directly, uh, only in a peripheral role, but I can't wait to find out what all happened here. So, Pete, I don't, I don't want to waste any more time. I want us to spend some time here. And if you can outline how this case got started and what your role was and, and the, the geographical areas that it involved and the amount of drugs and the amount of money and the amount of rest and just wow, us. that's what I want to hear. Well, Steve, I was the supervisor in Atlanta. Uh, I had was in I left France and then went to South Carolina. I, I was the rack in South Carolina. Two-man office, me and one age, Norm uh, Schumard, God rest his soul, he's p- passed away. And when I got to South Carolina, South Carolina was corrupt as can be. Marijuana coming into the state like you wouldn't believe politicians, mm-hmm. crooked, et cetera. And uh, so I went from a one-man office. There was, when I got there, there was only one case on the book. And uh, the previous wow. uh, gentleman that was the agent in charge had retired, has passed away. But his philosophy was no cases, no problem. Lots of cases, big problem. And yeah. so I had a meeting with Norm, and as a result, I had a meeting with Norman, the secretary, and I said, look, there's one case, and there's a reason why I'm here. Straighten out the office and to make cases. And I'll mm-hmm. guarantee you by one year from now, we're going to be the number one office in the United States with cases. So Norman and I started, and uh, we we made cases with the help of the Sheriff's Department, which I had liaison there, all the police departments in the state, SLED, State Bureau, Narcotics Division, mm-hmm. and uh, I had a meeting with them, and I said, look, I'm here to clean up the problem in the state because it's affecting not only your state, but nationwide, and they're using mm-hmm. your state. My goal is to bring these SOB to jail and put a stop to them. I don't care if they're politicians. I don't care if they're cops, sheriffs. We're going to take them down. And the sled guys and the sheriff's deputy, I said, you guys, I can't get a task force here, but I'd like to do an ad hoc task force. On my own. You guys have a very low budget to make cases. I got the money. In those days, the uh, racks were only allowed $2,500 to make a case. Mm-hmm. I called Miami, to, met with the director there, a good friend of mine, Jack, and, I, and uh, Dave Connolly. I said, look, this is BS. You're glad that I'm here. But uh, 2500 bucks. Uh, I want authorization on my own, 7500 bucks on a case to work undercover. I will work undercover with my guys. And um, I brought in seven deputies, sled agents, ad hoc, and I made us now hit the state. And we did. As a result, we made some of the biggest cases. I advised the U.S. attorney of his rights. He had uh, tipped off 
a guy that had smuggled in a load and oh. had him arrested. And the U.S. attorney said, how dare? I said, the attorney general told me to advise you of your rights, you SOB. Good day. About four months later, he died of a heart attack. I arrested politicians, sheriffs, and police. And we went to town, and we became number one in the United States in making cases. Then there was a contract to have me killed by politicians and attorneys, and I was tipped off by the solicitor of Columbia, a good friend of mine. He was a nonce person. He said, they're going to kill you. Called me up at 2.30 in the morning, his wife, and says, Jim wants to see you. They're going to kill you, Pete. Come to the house immediately. He told me the whole story and never advised my wife, told my guys what was going on. And next thing you know, uh, this senior senator, Columbia, some two guys showed up at his house with hoods and he stepped outside three o'clock in the morning and they told him, they said, uh, you have a contract out on Mr. Charette and his family. Here's what's going to happen. If you follow through with this, your grandmother will be dug up and killed all over again. You will be killed, your daughter, your son, and your wife. You will disappear from the face of the earth. Call it off now. You got 24 hours. Within 24 hours, I get the phone call. Contract has been closed. That's when I got a call, believe it or not, I got a call from the drug czar in Washington, Dr. Carlton Turner, one of my best friends, and mm-hmm. we're still friends. He was President Reagan's drug czar. And the phone rang. My son said, uh, the White House is on the phone. So I said, oh, that's Carlton. So I said, I answered the phone. What the hell are you up to? And he said, Pete, we're on a conference call. I said, Carlton, go F yourself. And all of a sudden, I hear this voice, hello, Mr. Charette. It was President Reagan. I <laughs> almost hit the floor. And I said, I apologize. Oops. And he's laughing. He goes, no, 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 no. Carlton told me about you. And he said, the reason this call that doesn't exist, God bless him, he's passed away. And he said, there's a problem at the Atlanta office. Needs to be straightened out. Guys are coming in, drunk, lunchtime, etc. I said, well, to be very honest with you, Mr. President, I've heard about it, and it's a shame. Mm-hmm. He says, Pete Carlton says, you're the only man that can go and clean up that office, and I understand there's a contract to have you killed. Would you accept my request to go there and be, co- and be the supervisor and straighten up that office? I says, I work for you, Mr. President. I'm on. A month later, I was in Atlanta. Changed the entire office around, put a stop to all the craziness that was going on, Mm -hmm. warned everybody, and we started making cases. And the RAC, uh, ASAC there, was a a good friend. He passed away. And I told him in secret, I said, here's the reason why I'm here. And he went blank. I said, you're a good man. You're too good. You don't want to hurt anybody. Let me straighten out your office. And I says, and we're going to be making cases. And that by making cases, we did. Ended up in shootings, killing, et cetera. And we made cases. I arrested the, sher- the biggest sheriff in, uh, in, in Georgia and uh, convicted him. He died in prison. And I arrested police chiefs, and we made cases with all the county deputies and all that. And as a result, Southern Comfort came into place. Mona Poland, who was a friend of mine who used to be with the Metro Dade Narcotics uh, when I was a detective, Mona Mm -hmm. comes into the office and she goes, Frog, I got an informant, and he said that he's been requested to transport a shipment from. Columbia from Pablo Escobar and Errol Rosenthal, who's a wanted fugitive by us. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's willing to operate and we can do the case. I said, Mona, 
how many people do you need? She goes, well, this is going to be big because the mob is involved, U.S. mob. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charles Alamo and uh, uh, Phil Bonadonna, two mobsters out of Fort Lauderdale, they had direct shipments from Pablo Escobar. And so we started the case, and uh, there was uh, just Mona and three agents and myself. I was working with them, and they were keeping me appraised. Next thing you know, we get started gotten Bonadonna and the Waymo came into uh, Atlanta, delivered to my undercover agent, $300,000, $400,000, bought, bought an airplane, and we had an undercover pilot. And we had bought a, st a stash house in the country out in Dallas, Georgia. And Southern Comfort became big. We got mm -hmm. shipments out of Tennessee, seized 250 kilos of cocaine, arrested Columbians with Uzi machine guns in their car, and the case got bigger and bigger. I involved, and I had good relationship with the FBI, and they were not active into narcotics like now they can do investigation. So... I called the FBI and the ASAC a friend of mine who was in the task force, presidential task force with me when I was transferred over to be represent DEA during Southern Comfort. And we got the FBI involved and uh, we became the transporter bringing in shipments and then we would seize them and we brought in close, uh, well, the entire conspiracy, the organization, there was 55 defendants when it was over, and they had bought in $8.3 billion worth of cocaine into the United States. We worked in Tennessee. Wow. We worked in North Carolina, uh, New York, L.A., Florida, and we kept the operation going for two and a half years undercover. During that time, uh, our office in Medellin was, uh, there was a two-man office there. And and we had them put a wiretap on Harold Rosenthal, who was wanted, and had escaped there, broke out of prison. And he was the broker for the U.S. mob, working directly at Pablo's headquarters in Medellin. And yes. as a result, uh, Mike Vahil who was head of the office there, uh, mm -hmm. Mike calls me up and I and we told him, says, look, can you put a wire on a Rosenthal? Our informant is in touch with him. So he said, "We, you got it. Pete. So while we're doing our investigation, picking up shipments, bringing it in, during that, that time frame, my boss calls me in, uh, Ray Vincic, God rest his soul, good guy. And he says, Pete, Channel 11 in Atlanta, their news guy is coming to the office, and he said that they intercepted a communication on a plane, and it sounded like a shipment of cocaine was coming to Atlanta. I said, oh, my God. Hmm. So he shows up, and he sits down. He was a good friend of ours. He became a CBS guy. Uh, we made his career with this case. And he said, uh, we intercepted this thing, and uh, we heard this uh, plane, and we— Knew he was coming from Colombia, and it had. They said it's Coke time. That was a signal that he was coming into Atlanta. Mm -hmm. he, we think it, that's a drug operation. You guys know anything about? It. Ray looked at me and I says, "Look, I'm going to tell you what's going on. I'm going to swear you in. You are not to do anything about this or mention anything." You will have the exclusive under this entire conspiracy, and you're going to become famous. <laughs> he looked at me, and I said, yeah, that's our plane. What we had done is we had sent a plane that we had purchased from the mob, and our pilot, we had put uh, uh, speaking hidden speaking uh, microphones on mm -hmm. the plane, and we were monitoring mm -hmm. him as he went, as when he landed— and he goes, uh, and he was taxiing in to do the pickup. He says, oh, lots of gringos with machine guns. Oh, my God, Pablo is here. In, in Atlanta? Huh? 
Is this in Columbia or in Atlanta? In Columbia. Okay. And and uh, he said, uh, Rosenthal is with them. We hear, hey, you're here, boom, boom, boom. And next thing, boom, boom, boom. We hear the bales going into the plane. And he and he's saying to them, okay, I'm ready. You ready to go? They said, thank you. And they closed the door. And he took off. And he goes, oh, my God. I hope we can get over these trees because we're overloaded. And he flew over the trees, almost went right into them. He talking to us, and he lands at the Air Force Base secretly. We pick up the shipment, take it to the safe house. Bona Donna and Al Lamo came, in, came up from Fort Lauderdale. And what we had done, we bought this house. And what I had the guys do and the team of all various cops that were working with us, we wired mm-hmm. the entire house to the walls and then redid the walls before they came and they checked out the house just to be sure they brought in a next cop from new york to do a search for any wiretaps on in the house and wow. when he came that's when we shut down the wire the uh, microphones and we mm-hmm. were half a mile away and i had guys and from tech installed on a pole that was right across the street from the house, transformer pole, and we had a hidden camera there so we could see what was happening. And next thing they did, and it was a clean, he left, we flipped the mics back up, and yeah. they said, we want you guys, lame on them, we want you guys to buy three, uh, two vehicles and have them ready for us when we arrive, and we're going to load up the shipment take it to Fort Lauderdale. And at that point, I had went from three guys, I had like 27 police, FBI, local sheriffs working with us directly on this case. Mm -hmm. And we monitored everything and did surveillance. As a result, we got shipments after shipment. And one of the shipments that uh, we got, it came into Tennessee and... uh, our office from Tennessee asked them, you know, with the state police, uh, they're going to come to this motel. The informant is driving, and he had a motorhome. Met these bad guys, and the uh, agent in charge calls me up. He goes, Pete, four guys came up. We've been working on these guys, and they're smugglers, marijuana smugglers and cocaine smugglers. And he says, they're loading up the bus. I said, okay, here's what you do. I says, he's been instructed, as soon as he leaves the motel, there's an exit. And I told him, get your bus a quarter full and tell them I got to pull in, load up for Florida, and pull in at the first exit and go and gas up. And then we will give the signal to move in because they'll go in and get something to drink and all that. Mm -hmm. It was three of Mm -hmm. them. So they pulled up to the gas station. Sure enough, the Cubans, they go in to get drinks and all that. And uh, our agent says, move in. And everybody surrounded the place, moved in. Inside the two cars were Uzi machine guns by the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. Their orders was, if you're stopped by any highway patrol or police, kill them. Seized the shipment. It was 250 kilograms of cocaine. And we arrested Mm -hmm. them. Now, panic sets in. Everybody's wondering, what the hell happened? And Pablo's on the phone talking to uh, Rosenthal. And uh, we need to know what's going on and what happened to our security. And next thing you know, uh, we get a message that Pablo uh, had a meeting with his staff. Rosenthal was there, and he assassinated, and the CI was there, assassinated the, his chief of security, walked behind him and blew his head for not doing his job properly. And the one wow. got back to us and said, well, at least he's taking care of the situation for us. We're going to keep going. Hmm. So... During that time, uh, we brought in shipments, and uh, we were arresting uh, some people. 
we followed that shipment all the way to Florida with airplanes and cars, and mm-hmm. the delivery was made at a safe house. And then the local cops, we had them hit the house on a tip, and they couldn't figure out what the hell had happened. And we continued the operation. And then we get a message from Mike Vahil. He calls me up and goes, Frenchy, have you heard the tap today? I said, no, I haven't gone to the wire room here because they were directly feeding uh, the wiretap on Harold's house to us also. And he says, Rosenthal just called the head of the head of cocaine operation for the six dose Granados and Rosenthal calls him and Sixo says to him, Pablo just called me. We got to kill the attorney general of Colombia. He's trying to extradite all of us, you included. And Pablo says, take him out. Says, Mike, mm. you talked to the embassy? Yeah, I talked to the guy in Colombia, in Bogota, the SAC, country attache, I should say. Ambassador was notified. I notified Washington and all that. And Mike says to me, he goes, look, Colombians, they were protecting Rosenthal. They were getting paid off. He says, the Colombian secret police told me, Das, that come and get Rosenthal. He's yours. So I says, I'm flying in myself, U.S. Marshal, and one agent. And I said, we'll meet with you secretly, and we're going to take Rosenthal down. And I set up the operation with the DOS, and we started a movement from Rosenthal's house to the intersection that he came down the hill. Every morning, he went to the Escobar building at 8 o'clock in the morning, and six of those Granados was driving the car, and we had practiced for a week timing of how long it took for him to go from his house to the traffic light T in his section. Mm-hmm. And we were clocking and having some of the covert cars go in front and behind him and slowing him down where by the time he got to the bottom of the hill, the light was turning red. We did that for 12 days. And then we said, it's time to hit him. He left the house, and we got behind them. And Sixto Granados, the head of the, the Barranquilla mob for Pablo, was driving, and we slowed him down. And sure enough, the time we got to the traffic light, people were just going to work and all that and crossing the... And we jumped out of the car, and I ran to the car, the window was open. Harold had the window open, sitting on the passenger side. And I stuck the gun to his head and say, Harold, DEA, United States, you're going home. He went flush. Pulled him out of our car. We took off with the U.S. Marshal myself. There's pictures in the book of us sitting with Harold. And we flew him out of the country. Well, all hell broke loose. And I got, uh, Harold was on the plane, and he uh, told uh, the guards on the plane, I'd like to speak to Mr. Charette. So we had rented the, the back of the plane, no passengers, and we were flying to Miami. So I said, huh? And he sat down next to Harold, and I said, there's a picture in the book. And I said, Harold, you want to talk to me? He goes, yes, sir. And he reaches out. And he says, I want to shake your hand. He says, you got some set of balls. And I go, well, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> he says, nobody ever expected this, and you did this. Good job. I says, Harold, I appreciate that coming from you. That's a compliment. Yep. And he said, one thing, Mr. Charette, get Mike Vahil and his agent and family out of Medellin because Pablo said, if they ever come and take any of us, kill the heel and his partner and their family immediately. We got. I got on the phone and called Mike and I said, call the embassy, get the hell out of there. And they did. They closed up the office. 
was and didn't reopen, and mm -hmm. we continued our investigation. Now, we brought him to Miami, and as a result, when he went to the uh, detention center to be transported to Atlanta, he said to me, Pete, I, I can't cooperate. I would be killed. Could you do me a favor? I says, well, you did me a favor by alerting me for my guys from being mm -hmm. killed with their family. I says, Harold, you're a, I hope you're a man of your word. What do you need? I want to go to Atlanta prison because my family lives in Atlanta. Can you get me transferred there? I said, I'll work on it. You gave me something, and I will help you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. so then we land. He goes to the detention center. Mm -hmm. I tell the director of the detention center, I said, no, look. He already broke out of prison, paid $55,000 to be break out. He went to Columbia, protected. He will try to break out of this place. Plus, he says, Pete will watch out for it. I said, okay. Next thing I get a phone call from Miami. One of our agents in Miami he says, Pete, you got Rosenthal at the detention center. We have a, an informant there. Rosenthal asked him, "Is there? do you know of anybody that could break me out of here? I'll pay $500,000. I said, yeah, I know, I know some people will do it. So I said, good, proceed. And uh, check in as cousins of Rosenthal come to see you. I alerted the uh, director. He says, you got it, Mr. Pete. So the plan was, Harold said, they told him, we will do it, buy us an, a scarab, transport you from here to uh, uh, the Bahamas, and then we'll fly mm -hmm. you in to Colombia. We need $50,000 up front, two kilos of coke. We need a scarab boat to buy, and... You got 24 hours, otherwise we ain't doing it. And what we'll do is we'll come in with a helicopter. The mound where outside where you go out on the uh, the mound and the uh, walking area, we will come there at noontime, land the helicopters, and we'll kill all four tower watchers as we come in. And you be out on the yard, and we'll take you to the bombers. He loved it. So he calls me up, <laughs> and he goes, Pete, are you working on my transfer? I says, hey, bro, I told you. I owe you, and I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Pete, I really appreciate it. I was recording every one of these calls. He would call me once a week. Where, where, What's the standing? And he was playing me, and I said, oh, I was recording everything. I said, I got you, you son of a bitch. So next mm -hmm. thing you know, uh, the day of his escape, we got the scarab, we got the money and the cocaine, 15 kilos that was also given to the undercover guys that was going to take him out. And uh, the day of reckoning comes, and all of a sudden, five minutes to 12, as he was telling them, I'm ready to go out on the yard, the director with two guys says, Harold, you're going to Atlanta. Mr. Charette arranged it for you. You're going to Atlanta. Now, what was he going to say? I'm supposed to escape? And he, I got a helicopter he coming. Like, and he came to Atlanta. He calls me up, and he goes, Pete, what the hell is going on? I said, Harold, is, that, is this how you thank me? I said, I got you where you wanted. <laughs> and he was babbling, and I said, look, pal. I paid you back, and I thank you so much. And I told the, the director of the prison in his hand, and I said, watch him. He will try to escape. He planned an escape, but he didn't, wasn't successful. Long story short, we ended up arresting nationwide 55 defendants, biggest cocaine conspiracy in the history of the United States. Two years of work, we faked. When they suspected that one of our pilots was possibly the one that was tipping off the authorities, they told Lamana and them, kill the pilot. 
And my agents said, boss, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to kill the pilot. Are you crazy? I said, no. I said, I got a friend in Hollywood. He can help me. So I called up this friend. He died. He was a, an actor, great guy. And I said, I need some help. What do you need, Pete? I said, look, I need some makeup guys come in and make this guy look like he was killed in a crash. I'm working a big case. I need your help. You got it. Then fake a car crash and had the car crash in the newspaper saying that this guy had been killed, blah, blah, blah. They sent a newspaper article to Escobar and, and Harold. They were as mm -hmm. it's me, and we continued the investigation. Then finally, when they gave the order to have, we intercepted the order that they wanted Laura Vanilla, the Attorney General of Colombia, who was working with us to extradite Escobar and the whole gang, Rosenthal included, mm -hmm. when that was in, intercepted, uh, that's when they told us, come and get, well, when we got that thing, within eight hours, Laura Vanilla was assassinated going home by two motorcycle guys. And they said, that's it. Come in and get Rosenthal. And we ended yep. up arresting 55 defendants. Attorney General of the United States called this the biggest cocaine conspiracy in the history of the United States. I had almost 55 agents. We were 24 hours a day on this case for two and a half years. Best agents in the world. And we took the biggest cocaine conspiracy people in the world down, the mob and everybody. And when Harold appeared in court, with, and you can picture this, the 55 defendants in the courtroom, they had to go in the room where they swore people in as, as citizen, mm -hmm. in a gigantic courtroom. And I'm sitting at the desk with the U.S. attorney. Harold's sitting with his attorney, and the rest of the, the goons were all with their attorney. Mm -hmm. And the judge read the indictment and all that, 52 pages long. And he said, uh, we're going to take a break. So took a break. Harold's attorney comes over and he goes, uh, Mr. Rosenthal would like to speak to Mr. Charette. The judge had said, after he read the entire night, oh, I have one indictment to unseal as of now. And he reads the thing. And I walk over to Harold and it said that I had communicated with him and arranged all these things and all that and was playing him. And he I, and I says, Harold, you want to talk to me? And U.S. Attorney stand there. He goes, Pete, shakes my hand. He says, you know what? You did it honestly. I respect you. Damn good job, pal. I says, Harold, I had to do what I did. You helped save my agents from being killed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, I paid you back, but you wanted to pursue this even longer? You can't do it. It's time. It's up. They were all convicted to life in prison. Mm -hmm. For almost two years, for almost two years, Harold used to send me a Merry Christmas card from the prison. Yes. And that was Southern Comfort. When it was done, uh, the news guy became CBS top newsman. And we exposed this. And uh, it was quite an honor. And I put in, oh, believe it or not, uh, Steve, uh, I'm a man that believes that you give credit to where it belongs and you recognize your people when they do something great. I've right. always done that with you guys. And I, myself and Vincent wrote up 55 people, FBI agents, South, uh, South Carolina, Tennessee agents and all that. And uh, deputy sheriffs, we wrote them up to get the attorney general's award for making this case and it was a joint effort by all agencies it went to headquarters steve 
with the embarrassment, and I say it in, in the book, in the second book, it was the biggest embarrassment. The director, ex-FBI agent, calls Vincic and myself and says, I've got the thing here. I refuse to sign it unless you put this man's name in it. And he gives us the name who was going to be a, a new ASAC in Atlanta. He was at his horse home. Vincic's looking at me, and he's going, Pete, and I'm shaking my head. I said, sir, with all due respect, withdrawing, withdrawing that request, we're not putting that man's name in, because he had nothing to do with this. How dare you talk to me that way? I said, calling it like it is. I don't play politics. These are my agent. These my uh, friends are liaison people. They deserve mm -hmm. this honor. Boom, he hangs up on me. Next thing you know, I get a call. Ross Perot. I want to honor <laughs> you and your boss and the director and your agents, five of them, to come to Dallas. We're going to have a supper in your honor for making the most historical case in history. You guys mm -hmm. are true Americans. You talk about an honesty. We oh, went yeah. and... He honored us. God bless him. He passed away. I ran into him two years later when I was in headquarters. I'm coming out lunch with a couple of guys. Taxi pulls up. Here's the, one of the most richest person in the United States. Taxi pulls up. He gets out of the car, and I said to the guys, hey, there, there's Ross Perot. As he comes up the step to the building, he goes, Pete, how are you? He remembered me. And they were... Their mouth was gaping. I said, I'm meeting this. Oh, yeah. They're shaking hands. I says, Ross, what are you doing? Oh, I'm meeting the boss, Jack. You got something going? Yep. I says, way to go easy. Yeah. Texas, you better be calling me. <laughs> that was the biggest honor. And we put mm -hmm. in everybody. And uh, we were denied the honor to get that award. But Ross Perot came through. And I had the best team in the world, DEA, in those days, were the best. You, you did yeah. your job. Yeah. You made me so proud. And I'm honored well, you. to have been on your show. And I hope that oh. we will see each other soon. Well, absolutely. I, I got some questions. Yeah, I got some questions. So is, is Rosenthal, is he still alive? Yeah. Harold's still in prison, but he got life plus. So mm -hmm. he's not coming out. Yeah. But uh, even though he was vicious and all that, and he worked directly as the broker for the U.S. mob, but uh, he uh, apparently, uh, I had that experience not only with him, but when I worked on the French Connection with the Corsican mob, when mm -hmm. we arrested Salvatore Lamana, which was one of the biggest cocaine case ever made. And uh, Salvatore, he was a fugitive from the United States, and I made the case against him. I was going to transport the, the shipment of 20 kilos that he was delivering at the train station. And uh, one of the crooked French police officers tipped them off as they were mm. delivering to us. And he said on the phone, get out of there. They're on to you. And he hung up. That's when the mm. director of narcotics called me and says, Pete, it's blown. Arrest everybody. We arrested everybody. Mm -hmm. Then I went to his office and he said, I want you to listen to this recording. As soon as I heard the voice, I said, that son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. He was a Corsican, mm -hmm. a born guy, and he was tipping off the French connection on what we were doing at times. And yeah. I said, where is he? He says, He's already in jail, Pete. Don't worry. We took care of him. <laughs> so, but uh, Rosenthal, uh, a lot of the French Connection guys, even after I was exposed and they knew that I was and they held me at gunpoint saying you're an agent and all that to threaten to kill me and I talked my way out of it. Uh, some of them, a couple of them that kind of rolled over, cooperate when they saw me. They said, we want to shake your hand. You did it good. You were honest. Yep. The, the, the informant that used in the case um, that flew down that they were going to kill, 
That sounds very familiar to Barry Seal. I know it wasn't because it's a different time frame. Yes. Uh, let me just say this about him. He cooperated because uh, he got tipped off that uh, he suspected that he had spotted surveillance cars while we were investigating this, and he spotted surveillance cars. He was a retired military officer hmm. in charge of radar hmm. coming out of the care. So he knew all about the, that. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. when uh, we got word that uh, he had called and wanted to meet with us, and uh, I was told, and he came in and he started telling us, blah, 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 this is it, that, that and I was called by Harold. He wanted me to transport, help him again. And I did stuff for him in the past, but now I want to help you guys because I don't want to be arrested. But he, went, mm -hmm. he was a piece of shit, okay? Yeah. It'll be blood. And the agent that controlled him got a little too friendly with him. And uh -huh. uh, unfortunately, uh, it caused some problems. Mm -hmm. and when we made the delivery, we were waiting for the U.S. attorney to give us the go signal to deliver the shipment. And the agent uh, and this SOB were at a uh, McDonald parking lot nearby, about a mile away from the mm -hmm. house. And I was there with one agent who had gone to Columbia with me. And uh, he said to me, he said, look, I'm not waiting anymore. I got to deliver it. I said, no, you're not delivering until the U.S. attorney says go. Next thing you know, I almost got run down. Wow. Wow. Yes. So there was some crazy stuff that happened. When I went to Columbia, of course, uh, we had gotten word that Harold was going to meet uh, Laura Vanilla. And uh, I went there because U.S. Attorney says, look, we need to have Rosenthal in person surveil and show that he is with these people. Well, Vanilla had called him to Barranquilla to come because they had to have a meeting because uh, Pablo was concerned about what all these seizures. And I said, mm -hmm. I'm going there. And I said to my agent, you're coming with me, but you're not going to be walking around and all that in the hotel. I got arrangements from the, our agent in Barranquilla uh, to go to this hotel, and we're going to register. I got a Canadian passport, da -da -da, I'm a Canadian. So we got there. We checked in. Now, as you walked into the hotel, there was a casino to the right, and then mm -hmm. a dining room to the left from the front desk. When I walked in, people are playing in the casino and all that, loud noise and all that. So we go to our room, and I got a room facing the street on the third floor, right where the entrance is, and I can see across the street where people would park. And my agent was in another room, and I told him, do not get out of your room at all. Why? <laughs> No, so he he did it here today, but he I had really he did not like me, but I didn't give a damn. I did mm -hmm. it, and I had certain techniques, and I learned through my career how things can go wrong. So right, I saw a convoy of five black sedans pull up. Guys, get out! I'm telling you, Steve, for real, these guys get out with Uzis. Machine gun to mm -hmm. protect Vanilla, uh, Laura Vanilla. They cross the street and they go in. I said, okay, I'm going to give them 15 minutes because I had to verify that Rosenthal was there with him and the meeting was occurring. So now we could say, yes, they went part with him. I went downstairs and elevator doors opened. I walk and I glance over to my right to the restaurant, empty, just all lights off, just a table, and there's vanilla and Harold, candle, clock. I walked up, grabbed the newspaper, got back on the elevator, back out. We confirmed it. Was so? Was there indication that so this is we're talking about Rodrigo Larabuni? Was there indication that he was corrupt? No. 
Laura, Laura Bonilla, the oh, yeah. gym minister of justice. Uh, Laura Bonilla, no, Laura Bonilla was not corrupt. He was working okay. with us to get the indictments going, and he had gotten gotcha. a green light, and that's when they killed him. And we tried Got to it. give him a message, and he thanked us. He was very polite and all that. And then he got into his car. As he drove down the street, two motorcycles came up. That's it. They killed him. That's when everything broke. And we said, okay, let's round yeah. up and take him down. So I was just going to say that uh, Javier and I were uh, in Norway speaking. This was before COVID. And uh, we were we were hitting all the Scandinavian countries. We were on a two week tour, and after we spoke in one of the one of the Norwegian cities, you know, we're in the green room afterwards and relaxing, waiting for everybody to leave. And uh, security came in and said, "Hey, there's a, a gentleman out here that's from Colombia that would like to speak to you guys." So we said, "Sure." You know, he said, "He's a young man." So we said, "Send him in." Security was there, and the guy comes in. And he said, uh, "Hey, I just wanted to tell you. I just listened to your story. Great job. Thank you for telling the truth." Just so you know, my history, my uncle was Rodrigo Lara Bonilla. And when he was killed, he said, I was an infant. And so our whole family, within just a matter of a couple of days after uh, Lara Bonilla's death, packed up and moved to Norway because Escobar was going to kill the whole family, which he was infamous for, right? This kid didn't speak any Spanish. He spoke whatever, the, I guess, the Norwegian language. But it's just amazing. And we told him, hey, you know what? Your uncle was a hero. He he had the stones to call out Pablo Escobar and open Congress and call him what he was, a drug trafficker and a murderer. And that's why he got kicked out of Congress. Just out of, curio out of curiosity, did this investigation, was that part of the indictments against Pablo Escobar down the road? Yeah. If, if Pablo was mentioned in, in it, of course, we couldn't arrest him. And uh, I would uh, love to come there, be with you on that deal. But uh, yeah. you, you did a good job. <laughs> a hell well, of a good job, pal. Well, we'll, we'll give all the credit to Columbia National Police because they, they yeah, took exactly. their country back. Exactly. And, uh, I was invited uh, here recently to go to Marseille. They were going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the French Connection. And they wanted me to come wow. down. And they called off the uh, program because of the weather and all that. But uh, mm -hmm. now French television is doing a narco series of French Connection. Uh, for two years, I've been working with them. And now, uh, after December, the first uh, uh, episode is going to be aired, and they're using my interview that they did for almost five hours with me and using all my material in my cases. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to have a French connection like a narco. <laughs> cool. Uh, very cool. Yeah. And things are, I'm getting a lot of offers, phony offers, Steve, and I'm sure you've faced it with yeah. uh, people who say, hey, I'm with such and such studio. We want to buy the rights to your book, but you'll have to pay us $10,000 that are now. And I say, oh, that, and that's it. <laughs> There's a scam every day. You know, there's a new scam every day. It's oh, amazing. Yeah. Uh, thank God that, that I have you to, I ask for your advice at times. And mm -hmm. now I also, I have a friend in Hollywood. And, uh, Jerry Petovich is his name. Ex-Secret Service was in Paris. And he, his office was right next to us. And he mm -hmm. and I that's a friend. He used to put security on, what's her name, the president that got killed there, uh, Kennedy. In France? Yeah. And uh, he was, uh, he used to do the security at the mansion in Paris. Uh, we used to, uh, he, uh, he and I, we used to do the town at nighttime after he got off the job. And we used to go and have a fun time. So this day, we're still in contact. But I've contacted him. Now he's coming out with another movie and another book, and he's had three movies made. And his first movie was To Live and Die in L.A. I don't know if you ever saw it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he's been I... giving me advice. And he said, mm -hmm. if they call you, call me. My agent will be in touch with them. Say, send a check and send it by mail. Don't accept anything else and don't give them any money. So... We're having yep. fun. <laughs> yep, yep. 
So you've got uh, you got your second book out now. Your first one was one hell of a ride. I'm looking at it here on the screen here, and now second book is one hell of a ride two. So this is the sequel, uh, and I love it. So the first one is one hell of a ride. The investigative and undercover life of a DEA agent. And then the second book is One Hell of a Ride 2, From the French Connection to Operation Southern Comfort. So uh, for our listeners, we've just scratched the surface. That was a, a multi-year investigation. Just due to time constraints, we only scratched the surface of the investigation. So I highly encourage you to, to take a look at that book. Support Pete here. His website is Pete Charette, and that's C-H-A-R-E-T-T-E, PeteCharetteBooks.com. You can also, all you have to do is Google Pete Charette, and you'll see it's on Amazon. It's on uh, Barnes & Noble. It's on booksellers that I've never even heard of. YouTube. Yep. You've got a lot of interviews. This this interview will be on YouTube, just so you know, Pete. Um, okay, thank you so much. Those that are watching it on YouTube, you know it's on YouTube because you're watching it right now. <laughs> but uh, I tell you what, brother, this is, some people probably think Murph just keeps bringing his old friends in. Well, yes, I am. But it's friends with stories and history. But I bring on the best guests. Steve, I bring on people that you're not going to hear anywhere else. Steve, I got one thing to say. Right now, with the uh, stuff that's coming through Mexico, the, uh, uh, what's my call it? Uh, not methadone, but uh, 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 fentanyl. Fentanyl. All I got to say on that is that right now, there's a solution to it. There's a solution to stop the whole thing. And I hope whoever becomes president, I know I risk my life all over Europe, behind the Iron Curtain, Colombia, and everything because of the drug problem that's occurring in the United States. And with this type of drug coming across Mexico, Mexico, I'll be honest, they're allowing it to happen. Mm -hmm. They're being controlled by the Sonola cartel. And if someone had, I'll use the word balls, mm -hmm. to do something about it, it can be accomplished. I guarantee you, if they gave us a green light and various agencies had the right to go ahead and do what I'm saying we could go in there covertly, assassinate every cartel member, and get rid of the Mexican cartel, the fentanyl pro problem. And we can do that at every country that has an organization that's sending drugs to the United States. That's the only way you'll solve the problem. Otherwise, corruption. Money talks, bullshit walks. You know it, I know it. Mm -hmm. And I've said, I've said a, a lot of speaking engagement. If DEA or whoever, the President of the United States, call me and say, Pete, we think it can be done. We want you to be involved. I'm in. Because yep. it can be done. We can wipe out all the world's cartel. In the two years, when I was working the French Connection, I had put in and saying, we need to assassinate the Corsican mob in Marseille, and we need to do a covert operation. Everybody agreed, even the French police agreed. And then Washington says, nope, we were going to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's but, just not going to happen. Know, you can only do so much, and what's happening is a disaster. Fentanyl is, is killing thousands of people, and we're allowing them to come in. The cartel yep. is behind it. The Mexican government is behind it. They're being run and paid for uh, by the uh, cartel. You know it. I know it. You've seen it. And I think it's time that we in America step up to the plate and put a stop to all this drug that's killing people in our country, kids, we don't need that. Yeah. You know what, Pete? When they when they came out with that term, war on drugs, in my opinion, that's the biggest misnomer the government has ever come out with because there's never been a 100% commitment from Washington to attack these problems that are in, in just decimating our country. 
and nothing's changed. It's, it's worse now than it was 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. For our listeners there, are we condoning murder? No, that's not what this is all about. We're discussing about how you would attack people that are murdering our citizens. But the attacked. truth is, and, and with, yep, without being political here, we don't want to go down that road for the, for game of crimes, but it's just not going to happen. So okay. it's not to take anything away from the brave men and women who are out there fighting the battle every day. I love them. My hat's off to them. They are true patriots and American heroes because they're willing to risk their own lives to protect all of us. So, Pete, uh, man, it's been a hoot having you back on here. Thank you so much for giving us your time and, and, and coming back for another couple of hours. Hope her paths cross again here soon. I haven't seen you in person for a number of years. I think the last time was up in Atlanta. Yeah. So, well, I'll be going to Florida uh, for Thanksgiving, and I'll give you a shout. If you're through Orlando, brother, give me a shout while we're here. Well, right? I, I think be. all the family's coming down. I'll be in touch, I promise, and thank you so much. And you're doing a fantastic job, and Steve. Well, thank you. We were brothers for life. Absolutely. So for all our listeners, uh, thank you once again for joining us here on Game of Crimes with Murph in the morning. Uh, I was saying stand by for the debrief, but we've kind of changed that around a little bit. So I just want to say thank you for joining us again. We look forward to seeing you next week. God bless. Well, unfortunately, that's it for this week's episode of Game of Crimes with Murph in the Morning. Thank you folks so much for taking the time to see and hear some of the best true crime content you can find anywhere. None of this would be possible without your support. If you didn't know this already, Game of Crimes is now on YouTube. Just type in Game of Crimes Podcast in the YouTube search bar. You can send me your comments on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or to our email address, which is Game of Crimes Podcast at gmail.com. Our website, it's gameofcrimespodcast.com. That's where you'll find all our episodes, books written by our guests, merchandise, and more. If you're looking for even more content, now go over to patreon.com slash gameofcrimes and sign up. There you'll find several bonus episodes each month, ranging from serious and current topics to some silly and fun events. And you can even get early access to each week's interviews before they drop on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. You can even subscribe for free and hear the first five minutes of each episode, and that's to help you decide if you'd like to spend some of your hard-earned cash to hear more. That's patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. To all our guests here on Game of Crimes, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. I mean that sincerely. Thank you for your service to your communities, to your countries, and for taking the time to tell us about your adventurous lives. May God bless and protect all the men and women in law enforcement, our military, and all of our first responders. And you know what? This goes for all of our listeners as well. Thank you for your continued support. And just one last thought here. It's okay for us to have different ideas and different opinions, but it doesn't mean we can't continue to be friends. All right. My final thank you. Thanks for joining me again to play the biggest, the baddest, the most dangerous game of all, the game of crimes. I'll see y'all next week.